We pulled up the driveway to the house. I was exhausted, but not neatly as exhausted as Maggie was. She'd done an amazing job at the gala. Her speech was one for the ages. She'd had plenty of practice over the years, though. We'd started the charity in Lisa's name a year after her disappearance. It was the only thing we could think of to do as more time passed without her. We had to make something positive come out of her vanishing. The press loved it, and we finally felt some kind of... relief. Some weight off of our shoulders. We felt Lisa would be proud of what we were doing, wherever she was. She was alive, we were sure of it. It's what kept us going, kept us together. Belief can do amazing things. When Lisa went missing that day at the swimming baths, we lived in a three-bedroom mid-terraced council house, with black mold on the ceilings and peeling wallpaper, leaks everywhere. Maggie slipped off her stilettos, and I aided her up the driveway to our five-bedroom estate, five miles from the nearest neighbor. Peace and tranquility. I I'd be lying if I said I thought we'd be living in such a grand design if Lisa hadn't disappeared. We'd been given a lot of goodwill online in the fifteen years that had passed. Most of that had gone into the charity, but we had to eat to survive and couldn't work as well as run the charity and push the search for Lisa, so we treated ourselves. The house was in the high six figures. The car is a high five. But Maggie, no, both of us, had been through hell. These things would never replace our daughter, but they would act as a plaster to slow the bleeding, a sedative to help us sleep. That was all. We reached the front door and I let us in. We switched the alarms off, and I poured us both a glass while Maggie got changed. I took the glasses of aged red to my beautiful wife. The years of stress had taken their toll on her, but only made her more beautiful in my eyes. She sat on the bed in her lingerie, peeling her stockings off. God, I loved her. I sat beside her and handed her the red. Have the numbers come in yet? She asked. Not last time I checked. Oscar normally sends them before midnight, though, I reassured her. You killed it. I'm expecting big numbers. There were deep pockets in the room tonight. She rested her head on my shoulder. Is it worth it anymore? She sighed. What? It's been fifteen fucking years, David. She's never coming back. We both know it. What are we even doing anymore? I was used to this post-gala Maggie. Not sure I'd ever nailed the right way to deal with it, but I expected it. I found the best thing to do was to let her sleep it off. There was so much build-up leading to these fundraisers for her, it was no wonder all the dark thoughts in the back of her head started to crawl to the surface every time. After a few gentle kisses and sips of red, I left her to drift to sleep. I wandered our estate, looking over the framed photos of our little Lisa in our hall, and the wall-mounted certificates and awards we'd received in the years since raising funds for missing and homeless children. Sometimes it was good to just take it all in. Remind me of what it was we were doing. I've it was as I was walking by the dining room that I noticed the footprints on the marble floor. They were petite. A mixture of mud and wet grass. They led from our open front door to the open fridge freezer door, where the cooked meats had been ransacked, to the conservatory. I held my smartphone at the ready, prepared to call for backup. I crept closer to the conservatory, the light not switched on, the footprints disappearing into the darkness. I switched the light on, and a feral figure cowered in the corner, shivering in fear, feebly cowering. What are you doing in my house? I hissed, wielding my phone like a knife. Get out or I'm calling the police, I mean it. Do you know whose house this is? Do you know who we are? I was trying so hard to not wake Maggie that I didn't recognize her at first. The girl. She was a girl. Well, woman by then. Twenty years old. Twenty and seventy-three days and six hours. It was Lisa. Our little Lisa. All grown up and looking like she went through the ringer. She was missing some teeth covered in mud and shit and God knows what else. <laughs> but as it started to dawn on me, I felt every part of my body go into turmoil. Like my entire past present and future, started flashing and changing and mutating. I didn't expect those feelings. When she said Daddy, with tears in her eyes, drool around her chapped lips, I felt, I felt disgusted. I walked over to her and held her. I held my daughter that had been missing for fifteen years. I, I held my daughter who was pretty much a stranger to me now. I held my daughter who smelled rancid, like death. 
and I squeezed the life out of her throat so quickly, I don't think she really realized until her heart stopped beating. While her mother slept, I buried our missing daughter in the backyard. There was no reason for the police to search here. We moved her ten years after she went missing. It would make no sense. And, uh, and it wouldn't make sense to stop making money for ourselves and the charity. It wouldn't make sense to upend our lives, all the good work we were doing. For this Lisa. She was never going to be our Lisa. I knew that. So I buried her. Maggie didn't need to know. Everything could stay the same. People were nice to us. Our lives were nice. Maggie enjoyed the grieving, I think. Sometimes it's better for the missing to stay missing.